Hey, this is Spencer Brown. I uh, just flew in from California. I'm in London today, first of two shows, and I'm gonna give you a look what happens before the show. Jet lag is interesting, for sure. And I've, I've kind of realized over the years how to, how to beat or how to play into the jet lag a little bit better. Because I'm from California, it's an eight hour time difference at the moment. I flew in yesterday, hardly slept on the, on the flight. I don't actually think I ever fell asleep on the flight, so I was up for like 30 hours or something straight um, last night, but I was forcing myself to stay up through the day. I was like playing Call of Duty in my room, just trying to, trying to just like stay up later, stay up later, stay up later, because the later I stay up, the later I sleep the next day, the later I can stay up tonight, because I have a gig tonight and I need to be energetic at two in the morning, I, I, I can't start getting tired at midnight or something like that. So I made it till 3 a.m. last night staying up, just couldn't, couldn't do any later. Um, woke up at nine in the morning and then went back to sleep and then woke up at 3 p.m. today and then we're having breakfast um, and then I'll probably do the same tonight. I'm gonna try to stay up till five in the morning because tomorrow I have another gig until two in the morning, and then we'll probably go to Fabric after that. So that's gonna be a late night. <laughs> so I need to get that energy. But I did get 12 hours sleep, which is great. I feel really good. Um, just not that hungry, honestly, because it's really early body time right now. I get really hungry when it's like the normal meal times. So, but you just gotta kind of force yourself to eat a little bit right now, but it's pretty much, why we're eating breakfast at four in the afternoon right now. <laughs> Bit of stubble here, I probably should shave that off, but we'll see. <laughs> Gotta do the hair though. It's a lot easier than, uh, than women getting ready, which now I'm done. So like, I don't have to put on anything else. It's like, I always see my mom and, and my friends who are women, like <laughs> spending like an hour or something doing, doing the same thing that just took me for 10 seconds. So I guess <laughs> it's like grateful uh, I can just do that and go right to the show because there's no, uh, no extra steps. That's all it is right there. It's, I look like I'm, I'm like 14 years old if I don't have a beard, honestly. I've shaved it once since I could grow it when I was 19 or so, and I will never shave it again. <laughs> Just got a really good show offer, because um, I think the US is kind of waking up right now, so... Um, we just got a show that uh, I've, I've dreamed of playing for a while, and uh, I, can't, I can't say it right now, but um, this was really exciting. It's always good to get a show offer as you're preparing for the show tonight, you know? I usually like to take January off. I think it's good to take a break. You can't, you know, I'm not a machine. You can't just tour every single month of every single year, I think. that wears your body down a lot. So I spent the last month skiing and a lot of family time, um, which is, you know, really healthy for me because I'm not that phys physical of a person, but I love to ski and that keeps me really in shape in the winter for sure. So got a lot of that in, probably go do that after this, <laughs> honestly, again. But tonight we have a show, so we need to prepare. Um, what, I, what I'm doing before the show, um, hi. I'm making different crates and I don't have a set list going into the show, so I have no idea what I'm gonna be playing, but um, I want to keep organized. So when I'm in the moment, I will be able to make decisions creatively very easily because everything will be organized. So everything is keyed out. So I know what key everything is in. I know what BPM everything is in, which is the tempo. Um, and everything is organized by energy. I have like a low energy crate, uh, a medium energy crate, a high energy crate, um, a techno crate, which is more percussive music that, that can kind of be mixed into any key. Um, I have some new, new stuff crate, the stuff that I really want to try out for the first time. And then I have my total crate where it's just all of those crates combined into one, sometimes just at a convenience if I'm just like in the middle of like going from medium energy to high energy, I'll just go to the total and just 
kind of maybe I'll miss miss something or something like that. But yeah, it keeps me organized. So when I'm playing live, I can really stay in flow state and not have to think, not have to worry. It's very obvious for me when I play live what the next track should be. It's like based off like the feeling of the room. So if you make a big push, if the, the room is really popping off and everyone's like going for it, it's almost like the next track maybe you want to pull back a little bit, maybe something a little more groovy, a little more heads down. Um, because that sets up the next push. Because if you're doing a push, bang it out, bang it out, bang it out. People get tired, you may kind of lose their attention, especially on a, a bit of a longer set. It's a, on a festival set, it's important to do that. But, but on a longer club set, you can't smash them out the whole time because they get tired. You, you can't get them tired, you know. Um, you also don't want to bore them. You can't play like kind of sleepy music the whole time and they, they go home saying they, it was just like a low energy show. So it's it's good to it's good to balance. Like overall, I wanna do this. Like the energy should go up as the night goes on. At the end, I kind of sometimes bring it back down the last 15, 20 minutes, something bit left field, just something, maybe stuff people don't expect for the last 15, 20 minutes. I find that's always fun to do, but overall it should go up. But within the energy flow, I like to, go down and up and down and up and down and up and down and then and it eventually takes a higher energy form but there's sometimes like a couple hours into the set and if I feel the room really needs a reset or a break I'll do some some really long breakdown and and then kind of reset with some different energy if I'm playing pretty pretty like on the grid music like one e and a two e and a three e and a four like bah, 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 bah. if that's the groove then maybe I'll do some sort of reset and then go like Dun, ga -dun, ga -dun, like something more swung. What I want to do when I'm playing live is create contrast. I want to play something dark and then play something melodic right after because it makes that melodic thing or like very happy. It, it makes it even more happy when the last thing was dark. Um, something that's a very percussive driven track into something that's a more melody driven track that's always really powerful and vice versa if you're playing some really melodic really like hands up music then you go into something like with bongos and percussion right after that, it's usually gonna get people dancing because it's contrast, contrast, contrast. Every track I'm choosing should be contrasting of the last track in some form. It should also mix well, but that's why I prepare, so it's really easy for me to make these decisions. I'm not even thinking when I'm DJing, I'm just, just having fun playing music because this takes hours for me, like preparing the right crates, preparing the right music. Um, even going into Logic, which is a, what I use to produce, and, and maybe I started a few new ideas recently, and I want to get those down into uh, a playable form that I can play out tonight for the first time. I think I'm probably coming in with maybe six, seven tracks that I finished over the last couple weeks that I, I've never played out before in my life. So. We'll see if they fit in the set, and if they do, we hope they, they go down well, because it's, it's a risk worth taking for me. Um, you know, one out of 10 times, maybe it doesn't go as planned. This is what I found. If you, if you take a risk in your set, say I take one risk, like a track that I'm like, ooh, I don't know how this is gonna sound, I don't know how people react. You better make sure the next track after that risk, you have something that you know is gonna really hit well. Um, because in that, in that case, it's okay that you took a risk and maybe it didn't go as you thought, but the next one should recover your risk and get the energy right back to where it was, and that's totally fine to do. I find it becomes messy when you take a risk and then you have another risk and then you have maybe another and there's like a few in a row that don't quite hit the crowd very nicely and then you really start to lose people's attention and it's really hard to regain after you kind of get into that mode and I've, everyone's done it you know i've done it you know everyone luckily not as much now you know knock on wood not as much now uh, it's very rare that i'll have a few misses in a row or something like that but you know it's happened before um in my early years i think it happened when i was learning i started djing when i was 12 11 years old so it's been maybe i've been djing for 16 17 years now which is that's crazy to think about. It's been that long, you know. But but there 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 have been learning moments, and I'm still learning. Every every set you play, you should learn. If you're not learning from from every year, I think that's not a good thing. You should be always learning. Um, it's how you get better, you know. So anyway, making my crates. 
There are some cities, some crowds, maybe two thirds into the set, I'll start kind of venturing into the techno crate, play one of my like heavy, heavy kind of dark heads down tracks. And sometimes the reaction just elevates the room and there's this explosion of all these people really going for it. I play another techno track, people are going crazy and I'm like, this crowd really wants the, the, the heads down dark stuff. And I sometimes will go down that path for 30, 40 minutes, um, maybe even more, depending on the crowd. Um, some crowds, you go start tiptoeing into the techno and they're just not about it. Um, you maybe they're, they're, you just kind of see people like kind of going like this and they aren't really going as crazy. And I know that I want to tiptoe the line so I can push some people's taste a little bit, but. You can't go too deep into it because then you're going to lose people. But that's all like reading. That's why that's why I do what I do because it's important to like look and look l like take the average of the room. You know, if you have if you have a few people going crazy and a lot of people kind of like going like this, you need to kind of change it up. But if everyone is kind of moving, then you're kind of going down the right path. And once you find that path, it's easy for me. Like and sometimes often it's on the first track. Like when I play my first track, boom, the room's locked in. I'm like, okay, my job's easy, you know, then, then you can just kind of play whatever, <laughs> which is nice. I collect a lot of music. I'm, I'm always on the hunt for cool, unique music that maybe doesn't really sound like too much else. So I have a lot of these tracks in my Spotify library. Um, in fact, I have 50, 51 tracks. Oh, wait, no. 57 tracks since my last gig that I've found that are potential things that I could work in my set, but that's obviously a lot of tracks. So what I'm gonna go do now is listen to these, kind of skim through these 57 tracks that I found, make a playlist called like January Discoveries or something, and maybe choose the best, the ones that really catch my attention. It's probably, because I've done this so many times, probably somewhere between 10 to 20 of those 57 are gonna be like, jumping out of me, these are possible ones to play. Then I'll go in and really listen in detail to those 10 to 20 tracks, like really sit there for, for minutes and, um, and listen to how they could work into some of my music because my set is mainly my music, but I like to play other people's music when it really fits with my music. So I'm gonna listen to them in detail, but, but <laughs> I really make sure that very few other people have found these tracks or are playing these tracks because I want my sets to be unique. I don't want to play tracks that everyone else is playing right now. I think that's, I just try to avoid that. And that's, that's okay if some people want to do that. That's just like not what I like to do. So I check 1001 track lists, which is an amazing website where people, you can see what tracks people have played in the past. And I'll, I'll, I'll just go on here and I'm like, oh, this, I really like this track. I'm going to see who's played it. And the last time someone has played this track is 2018. And basically one, two, three, four, five, five people have played the track and it was all in 2018, right when this track came out. So I consider that kind of an undiscovered track. Like if, if not many people and not many big names have played this track, I feel like I can play this track now. But if I'm looking at the list and it's been played like 60 times by a bunch of big artists, I don't, even if I like the track, I would not play that track because it, it just doesn't feel fresh. This, this feels fresh to me because it, there's very few people playing it. So what is it? So I'm playing two and a half hours tonight. General rule of thumb, it's about 12 tracks an hour, maybe 13, maybe 14, maybe 11, somewhere in that range. So I would assume I will play between 29 to 33, 34 tracks tonight. And I would probably hope that half of them are really new and fresh. And then half of them will be tracks that people know, like from my albums or from past releases or stuff like that. I, it's, it's important because if people are coming to the Spencer Brown show, they want to hear Spencer Brown music that they've heard. You know, like that's, that's really important. But it's also important that they hear music that they haven't heard. So balance. We are talking about contrast earlier. That's another contrast I'm very conscious of. If I play a track that no one knows that lights a room up, then great. Then maybe I can play another track that no one knows. Maybe it doesn't quite light the room up as much. Then I play a track that everyone knows that's my own. Then the room lights up again. And I'm like, okay, cool. That was a slam dunk. 
now I can try something that no one knows. And then I play something that no one knows. And then I try something that people know. It's like, you can't just play, or you can, but I choose not to play like, track no one knows, track no one knows, track no one knows, track no one knows, track no one knows. I try to kind of do like, track no one knows, track no one knows, track everyone knows, track no one knows, track everyone knows. You know, like switch it up a little bit because it keeps people's attention, keeps people on their toes, makes my job easier. Contrasts, contrasts are everything in a set. So there's a multitude of reasons why I would play out music that maybe gets released in a couple years or, or never gets released. I think, first, I'm not really thinking about what I want to release. I just think about what do I want to make for my sets? Like, what, what is my set missing? And I, I just write the music that I want to play. <laughs> and so not everything has to be released, you know? I think there's a certain pressure when you release a track it has to be, you know, representative of, of where your direction's going and all that stuff. And sometimes I just make tracks that are just tools for my sets. They don't need to be a, a, a release track. They're just a, a tool. Also, there is a sort of mystery you can create if you're playing a bunch of music that sounds like you, but people don't really know what it is. That... For me, when I go see artists who are doing that kind of thing, I'm just like, oh, that's super cool. Like, that's something he's working on or she's working on. That's, um, you know, there's something special about that because that, that makes the shows that much more special. Like, then I want to go to that person's show because I know I'm going to be able to hear a bunch of music at that show that I wouldn't really be able to hear elsewhere. And that's a, that's a, that's a great reason to go to shows. Like that's a, a lot of my favorite artists play music that that no one no one has. Um, and last reason for this is some things just take. If there's a sample, it takes years to clear a sample. We're working on a track right now. Um, I finished it maybe three years ago, um, and we are still in um, a legal battle basically with uh, with the sample. Not illegal, nothing illegal here, but uh, we're we're legally clearing the sample. I can't just sample something and put it out. You know, you, there's big legal process, clearing publishing, clearing the master, like all the stuff. And um, the, the, the legal stuff has taken a few years. Um, so that's, that's why something, some tracks just take like three years to get released because there's a lot of legal stuff that goes behind this, but, but I can play it out at the shows, no problem. So <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. I'm finished preparing for the show. Um, it's. I'm coming in tonight with 154 tracks, um, and that's about 18 hours of music, and my set is two and a half hours, so that shows you the, the vast selection I have to choose in a set that's about six, 15 to 16 hours of music that I'm not gonna end up playing tonight. I prefer to play on um, SD cards rather than USBs because First, the, the, in a very intimate gig, um, the SD cards go into the deck rather than stick out and no one can smack the, the USBs. I've actually had that happen to me before where some drunk person will, will like be reaching over and then they'll knock the USB out. I used to have like a little USB pouch, but it was, it was like thick in my pocket and this is just nice and slim. So, um, and I just got used to it. It's like once you start playing with SDs, it's like, feels so convenient, I don't know. I, I just, it, there's no right or wrong, I just like to, like to play with SDs. So right now it is 10.38, I'm on at 11.30. I don't feel jet lagged right now, I don't feel bad. It feels like a normal gig in the US, like if I just woke up you know, in California and I'm playing a gig that night, you know, I don't, I don't feel tired at all. And even when I'm jet lagged, I can play, like when I go to Australia or India or something, that's such a big time difference, you are like, you don't know what is going on. But when you feel the crowd energy, it's like, you're just, you're back in it. But, but right now before the gig, in, if I were jet lagged, I'd just be like, I do not want to go to a club right now, you know what I mean? But I do want to play music for people, you know what I mean? But, but right now I really want to go to the club, I really want to party, I'm like ready to go. And uh, 
Um, that's because of that weird sleep cycle, strange touring tip that I do, you know? <laughs> so the, uh, I like to eat pizza when I'm touring, but the pizza boxes never fit in the mini fridge in the hotel because I don't eat the whole thing and I want some after the gig. So a, uh, a little solution. Um, always when I'm in hotels, I'll take one of the extra towels and I'll wrap my extra pizza in the towel, as you can see right here. And um, then you can just close the towel and pop it in the fridge so you can eat pizza after the gig, you know? Because some cities there's not food open. I'm sure in London there's food at three in the morning or whatever, but a lot of cities I play in, everything shuts down at whatever, midnight, 10 p.m. So I don't have food after the gig and I'm always ravenous after the gig because I'm not that hungry before the gig. I'm like a little bit nervous, kind of like preparing, working hard. Once I'm done playing, I am so hungry after I play. So this, this pizza technique has, has come in handy a lot so I can get some, get some pizza after the gig. I was in London last, um Jeez, that's a, that's a tough one. Over two years ago, it's like, I don't even know what time is anymore because of the pandemic. I just have no idea when I was here last, but I, I've been here many times. I've been here maybe, maybe 10, 15 times or something like that. Um, not 10 to 15 shows, but I uh, probably played here six, seven, seven shows here. Uh, always been amazing. The crowd's always really up for anything. It's always great to be in the UK. Um, but really pumped for tonight. Haven't played this venue before. It's called Colors, it's in Hoxton. Um, we'll see, I mean, I, I've heard great things, so it's sold out tonight, so that should be usually a good sign of uh, people. Uh, <laughs> it's sold out like months ago, which means I think people are gonna be pumped to be there. So that's, that's good, because I'm gonna come in with a bunch of unreleased music tonight and uh, try it out and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. 